excited to be here. I, I do have to say, there's like one rule I try to go with, which is never follow a speaker with an accent. Because there's just like nothing I'm going to say that's going to sound as good as someone with an accent. And then to follow someone who's funny that also danced, like I feel like I'm set up to fail, but we'll give this a whirl. Um, I'm very excited to be here. As Rand mentioned, long history with Moz. Big fan of the community that Moz has built, all of you. Um, and also this topic is something I am particularly obsessed with. And if you ask me what do I spend my time thinking about, it's this. It's, it's how do you organize for growth. It's literally right here all the time. Um, how do you stand up the teams? How do you hire against them? How do you systematically approach scaling channels? And so that's what we're going to talk about for the next kind of 30 minutes. Um, I do talk fast. I use my hands a lot. I'm an East Coaster. Uh, so try to let it you know, hit you, let it flow over you. And if you guys have questions after, we can always find each other later and talk about it as it relates to your business or your channel or your team. So kind of jumping in. As Mayor mentioned, we can talk about ClassPass another time, but we are based out of New York. We're a very fast-growing company. We're about four years in, but we've grown to over 200,000 subscribers. We have a community of over a million. We've been able to kind of launch different products, scale to 39 cities. There's been a lot of growth um, and a lot of hard challenges along the way that, that kind of contributed to that growth, and you'll hear about some of that today. But out of that also comes a lot of great assets that you can use for growth. And so we're going to talk about how you can actually mobilize around specific assets you have at your company to get what I'm calling inflection growth. And that's what we want to tether to. When we talk about what is growth today, I'm not just talking about up and to the right. And it's not that I don't love incremental growth. I think it's great. I think it's great that if you know, today you have a dollar, tomorrow you have two, that's valuable. Your businesses are growing up and to the right, that's great. But what we're really after is inflection opportunity for growth. It's shifting the momentum your company has so that you can build into those margins, you can pull more money in and reallocate and distribute it in new and exciting ways faster than your competitors so you can win the market. So that's the type of growth we're talking about today, redistributing the margins that you're building so that you can grow faster than your competitors and hopefully so that you have a transformational year because that's what we're all after, right? We don't want to be second best in our arenas, we want to win the market. And to do that, you have to be better, faster, and more resilient than any of your competitors that you're fighting against. Whether that be channel, platform, campaign, it doesn't even matter. There's only three ways to grow a company. We all know them, right? You either acquire more people, everything to do with acquisitions, leads, emails, eyes, traffic, interest, demand, or you retain them longer, right? We increase their LTV, we keep them in the ecosystem, we redistribute their excitement into our ecosystem, we get more activity, more engagement, or we monetize them differently. We increase their ARPU, right? Their average revenue per user. That could be a cross sell, a side sell, an upsell, whatever it is. These are the only three ways to grow, and it feels so simple. Everything we hear for all these days and everything we do in our rooms, all the brainstorms we have, fundamentally the tactics come back to these three buckets. So why does it feel so damn hard, right? In, no matter what happens, I'm just shocked. Like, we have a great quarter. I get in the, in the room with my CFO. We reforecast. I see my next quarter's plan. I'm with my team, right? So I'm like faking it. I'm like, we're going to crush it. This is going to be great. Look at last quarter. We're going to do great. Then I go home. I like shut the door. I sit on my couch and I like, what's going on? How am I going to hit these goals? <laughs> What is going on? I don't know. I'm out of tricks. I've tried all the levers. I've done all the tactics. I, I need something even bigger, even better. It's just always more and more. It feels so hard. And there are reasons it feels hard. There are things that have fundamentally changed and shifted under us that have made it harder for every marketing leader in the room. Whether you're leading a team or a channel or a platform, or you're just a high-performing IC that is responsible for a very important KPI, everything we know is, is really changed. And these paradigms are actually staring us in the face as we think about how we want to grow our companies. So I want to talk through just a couple of them before we start to talk about ways that we can work around them and through them. So first and foremost is ownership. Who owns growth at your company? My favorite question. I used to ask this because I thought it was like provocative to ask in a room. Don't do that. No one likes that person. No one like, they're just like, ugh, um, right? And, and the reason is, is because we used to own it. Eight to 10 years ago, it was very clear because we acquired new people. It was all about CPC, CPA, CPL, CPEs. We brought them in. And you know, my, my background's performance. You know? That's where I started 15 years ago. And I used to bring people in and throw them over the fence. I'd be like, good luck, product. I hope you do well. 
And then I was like, whoa, we own it together, right? So all the platforms that came up, it was mainly because there's all these different platforms we can acquire into, and there were better analytics tools that showed us we could actually come together with the product team in early life and activation, increase our CVRs, whether that be trial, conversion, however, and we could also increase the LTV, mainly in that early life activation. And so we started to come together on our roadmaps, and we both owned growth. It was a shared goal. And then we realized to do that, we had to build into the platform. So we had to bring engineering in the room, because we couldn't just build something hacky in the beginning and then not have it built into the back end. So we had to bring in the engineering stakeholders. And then we realized we needed, oops. Then we realized we needed to bring in the analysts, right? Because all this data had to flow full funnel, and I had to understand everything from beginning to end to then come with a recommendation on how we were going to grow the company. And the real problem there is that's four different teams with four different roadmaps and four different stakeholders. And all of them feel responsible for the outcome of growth. And we'll talk about all the dynamics that come from that and ways to organize around it, but this is a fundamental shift that just wasn't there 10 years ago. The second biggest change is the organizational structure itself. I'm always shocked by this because, you know, I'm lucky enough, in fact, uh, we just heard from Matt and he mentioned Reforge, which is a great community of growth leaders, and we get in a room often, I fly to San Francisco to sit down with these people, and you're like, what is this room going to talk about, all these people that are solving growth at their own independent companies? It's always organization. Who, who sits where? Who works with what? Who owns what roadmap? You know, like, it's always about how do you organize? What's the title? Who, what type of person do you hire in? Um, and it's hard. This was one of the first published team formats. LinkedIn came out with it many years ago about what their growth team looked like. And look, it looks fundamentally different. It's not a traditional map that we would expect a team to see. You've got kind of SEO as a squad. It owns SEO, CRO, public profile. You've got network growth as a squad, people you might know, virality, connections. You've got onboarding as its own squad with activation, early life, and intent discovery. And then you've kind of got comms, which is basically touch point management with you know, push and resurrection. Now, these four squads are very different. They're cross-discipline, right? They've got product, they've got marketing, they've got CX or customer experience. And the real challenge is LinkedIn publishes something like this and they grew very fast. And our CEOs hand us this and they're like, build the team. And I'm like, but I'm not, I don't even like work at LinkedIn. I, I don't, but that's not, a, we're not even a marketplace. You know, like, and you just, you, you're like, okay, I, I need to organize differently, but I don't know how. And we can't find the right roadmap. Like, we, we try to look at our bag of tricks of how we've organized teams in the past and it's not quite working. And that's a huge challenge that faces us. What we have to end up doing is actually thinking about the functional skills. When you build these independent squads, and we'll talk more about it, you need to have someone who's creative, so understands customer experience. You need to have analysts represented, someone who can think through how the data is going to be collected and leveraged. You need to have someone who's technical in the room so they can tell you if it can be built and how long it will take to scope that out. And then you need to have someone, and I like to call this loosely intuition. This is a big mistake a lot of companies make. They, they have these people at companies that have proprietary knowledge that know all the things that were tried, all the things that weren't tried, and all the gaps in the way they track in the systems, and they put that person on a legacy product. They don't bring them into the new exciting ideas or the new products or features because they know it so well. And the problem there is that person has the best intuition in the room. That person has the proprietary knowledge that can help solve some really big problems. So these new squads that you form as you organize around growth have to have all of these stakeholders represented, and that's really hard to do. The third biggest change that's happened around us is you need to know who to hire. I mean, we're all incredibly lucky. Everyone in this room is in a discipline that is needed right now. All of you get jobs every day, I'm sure, offered to you. We know a domain that is going to grow and scale with the world ahead of us, and that is an exciting time. The problem is all of the other companies are also hiring really great people. They're also hiring all of us, and we're competing with the best and brightest minds because it's an exciting domain for people to get into. We do need to hire different people, and Rand actually introduced this to me a couple years ago. I've since used it many times, which is the idea of the T-shaped marketer. We all know that pretty well. We're in marketing, you're really deep in one domain, but broad in most. I actually extend that to be a T-shaped hire in general, and I make the really deep domain marketing and broad in the rest. So what you'll actually see is the best people to put against growth initiatives or to organize around culturally for growth tend to be someone who knows either product or marketing or analytics really deep, but they tend to also understand product and engineering and CX and ops and finance and pricing. And they have a much broader skill set. They have curiosity about them, and that does a couple things. One, it builds a lot of empathy, and you're going to need that because all of these teams are going to have challenges when they roadmap and score. It also builds a lot of interest on how you can grow together and how things can integrate. 
And that's when really magical things happen, right? Is when we integrate all of our different platforms and we get views and insights that our competitors don't have. And that takes a different type of hire. It's someone who wants to step outside their domain. So all we have to really do, right, like fundamentally, change how we organize, how we roadmap and plan, and who we hire. That's like not that hard. Oh yeah, we also have to do this with beautiful marketing on a budget, with limited resources, quickly, effectively, and better than anyone else in the world. Like, feel free to just freak out. You all just read the asterisks. But like, it's so hard. I mean, I'm still also trying to do the best SEO in the world, the best PPC. I'm trying to stand up the best campaign for holiday. I'm trying to understand if I should refresh my brand or not. I'm still trying to like coordinate with CX on who owns social CX. Like, I'm doing all of that and I'm trying to reorganize my team, find new hires that have a growth mindset, and systematically set up to scale faster than any company in my domain. That's why it's so hard. The good news is it can be done, and even better, there are patterns. The fastest growing companies in the world have similar patterns. And what's so great about today's sharing economy of information is that they share it. They do retrospectives on what and how they grew their, fast, their companies so fast, and they share it. And so we can actually look back at these companies that we want to emulate, and you see that they invested similarly at the beginning. They didn't invest similarly at the beginning. They organized similarly at the beginning. They hired for certain types. They culturally created different systems. And that's what I want to talk about today. That's where we're going to go. So I'm going to throw a ton of tactics at you right now. Things that I've seen work, things that I've personally experienced that didn't. Um, again, if we have questions at the end or if we have time later tonight, like we can dig in on it. First and foremost, the fastest growing companies in the world invest in the views that matter, and they did it very early, very early in their company. It became a DNA fabric for them. This is the most useless graph in the world. I hate this graph. And the crazy part about it is, this is a growth graph. It's up and to the right. We get them every Monday, right? Our team send us these graphs. Don't worry, guys. It's growing just like it did last week, week over week at 2.24%. This is the second most useless graph in the world. It just compares channels. It just shows me, don't worry. That channel's still 2.5x more than that other channel. And it's kind of crazy to me that we're still reporting on this. And in fact, we heard a little bit about this yesterday during one of the email presentations where Jordan kind of said, like, it's not about the vanity metrics or the things that are working, but are you turning your eyes to the metrics that aren't? Are you turning your eyes to the metrics you're not even tracking right now that could fundamentally help you understand the system better? And this is the real reason. It's not even so much that the graphs don't help us identify what's not working or what we should be looking into. It's the time that's wasted. And this is the theme of fast-growing companies. If every Monday your channel owners are reporting out on those useless graphs because that's what you always do and you need to know if something's changed, and they lose half a day. Half a day every week is two days every month, which is 24 days a year, which is a month. You just lost a month of someone you hired to run a channel to grow your company. And your competitor, if they don't lose that month because they figure out a different way to report, a systematically different way to look at the, at the uh, data and a way to do it in a, just a better, more holistic way, which we'll talk about in a second, that's a real problem. That's how you lose. That's how you lose your arena. So what does that look like for real? Let's talk about it. First and foremost is the full funnel view, and I can't stress this enough. In fact, somewhere in this room is Matt Park, who is our director of growth operations on my team. His team is responsible for so much of the success you're going to hear me talk about today. And, uh, and what he's been able to do is bring analysts, data scientists, and integration specialists to the marketing team and connect our systems. Every platform over here for acquisition is now tied to my engagement metrics for my product. I know the LTV of my paid advertising creative. I know the referral of the customers that come off a certain campaign and promotion. I need to know this. That's where you identify the magic, the full funnel view. And that's hella hard to stand up and maintain and do it in a way that everyone around you knows how to do it and where to look for it. So you have to bring the front dashboard to all the data. Every marketer needs to be able to see the full funnel. If they only know their channel or their silo, they won't be able to see the magic. And these smart people need to be able to see it to come with the great ideas. 
You need to have the cohort views. You need to revisit your attribution. Many of us still work on last touch because it's really hard to redo attribution. You have to work with your finance team. You have to redo your historical views. All your reporting has to be recategorized. That's why it's hard. That's why the best companies do it, and that's why they win. Six months of redoing your attribution model is six months of redoing your attribution model. It's exactly what it is. Sign up for it. Do it with vigor. Like, it's so worth it, you know? You have to be able to understand things like network effect and virality. We, can, we convolute these a lot as marketing. We work with our product teams, and they're actually working on network effect, which is bringing someone in adds value to the product, and they start to organize around that in early life and onboarding, where they capture information to make the product more accessible and better. What they don't necessarily build for is virality or K-factor, and that's the idea that when someone, brings, when someone comes in, they bring in more value than themselves, so one equals one N. It's a referral, it could be a share, it could be some sort of moment that's gonna drive my acquisition funnel into a higher and more fast-track momentum. If you aren't working with your product team to think about that in the first couple moments of your product platform, you're in trouble. Because the companies that do that do best. And that builds a flywheel that I could never buy into. My cat could never be as low as that moment, right? But you have to build into that. You need to understand your growth mix and cannibalization. How do your tiers play against each other? We always say to ourselves, especially in subscription business, but every model has it, upsell, right? Get them to use it more. What if it's actually better if someone's low usage to drive them down and redistribute them in a different monetized way? Take that money, reinvest it in your margin, and grow in a different way. Like, you need to understand the full system. You can't just assume best, pa like best practice of like moving them up or getting more money from them. You might actually need to put them where they need to be and find a different way to help that serve your business. So all of these things are really hard to do, but these are the views that matter. The tenure journeys you do, we often think about early life, midlife, late stage, LTV. Maybe something like an RFM analysis is important with recency, frequency, and monetary. Maybe you think about what their NPS is, and if you move them from a six to a seven, what that means for their ambassadorship and their referrals and their social networks. Those are the views that we have to like, challenge our teams to systematically standardize and then report on in our front end dashboards. This shouldn't be impossible to get to. This should be Tuesday morning over coffee reviews. Because we're smart people. And if we see this, our synapses are going to fire in great places. The second one, and this is one I learned the hard way, because I was the opposite for like seven years. <laughs> Growth as a decentralized responsibility. Very provocative statement. Half of people in the room are probably like, no, growth is a centralized responsibility. But it's not true. In my opinion, how you organize is either going to fuel or kill growth. There's no way around it. Oftentimes, I sit down with someone over coffee, and they talk about how, you know, how am I going to set up for growth? And I'm like, well, how are you organized, right? Who owns growth? How does it look like? And it tends to be sitting in this one team. They want to hire, like, a VP of growth or a chief growth officer, and that person is going to, like, have tentacles and all these other teams. That's very hard to organize around long term. And instead, then, you kind of start to look like this. It's just the very standard, right? Every team has a roadmap, has a leader, has their own marching orders, their own OKRs. And the problem with this is it might wrap around to be the same two or three big levers for the company, but probably not. The chances of one of these squads fighting with the others and actually doing OKRs that wash each other out is probably what's going to happen. Instead, you need to organize like this. Growth is a decentralized responsibility. Knowing the two or three levers that matter most for your business, and when I say levers, I mean what metrics that you move will give you the most margin to play with and redistribute into your business to fuel growth. I'm not sure if you guys have read the book, The One Thing, but I love it. It's a great book. It basically asks the question, what's the one thing you do today that will make everything else easier? That's the metric that you decentralize, bring squads from cross disciplines around and, and, and work toward. So we did this actually in January of this year. We wanted to make runs against our CAC our churn and our burn at ClassPass. We wanted to have a transformational year against these three metrics. So we blew up every team's roadmap. That was terrifying, by the way. A lot of emotions to work through, but it felt like the right thing to do. We brought the whole company together, and we're like, we are not letting these three metrics incrementally approve for the rest of the year. We're going to fundamentally change them in the, nine, in the next 90 days. So what we did is we gave each of them a czar, the program manager, then we gave them each their own working teams, cross-disciplinary, CX, plans and pricing, product, engineering, marketing, creative, product design, ops. We put them into rooms. We got out of the way. The leaders got out of the way. 
and we said, come back with the waterfall of ideas that you think can actually move the needle on these metrics. It was beautiful, the ideas they came up with. The way they leveraged each other's team's tools and hacks and manual processes, the way they offered up help, the way they traded temps even, it was beautiful. And in 90 days, we transformed all three of these metrics. CAC dropped by over $25. Churn dropped by multiple basis points to the headline. Burn improved over $400,000 a month. And it was because they could see areas because they're closest to it. And I got out of the way. I, don't, I shouldn't have to approve these ideas. I don't even know what I, I don't know it as well as they do. But you have to create different products. That is like, this feels culturally scary to a lot of companies. It feels impossible for big companies. But why? Why is it actually impossible? So how do we do this? You have to identify the metrics that matter. The whole company needs to know those three or five things, and you have to agree on them. There can't be 10. You need to have a full stack team for autonomous support. You need to have some sort of driver for this roadmap management because someone does need to be accountable for progress and lack thereof. Some of the best meetings we had is when what we thought would happen out of one of the tactics didn't. Got everyone back in the room. We met once every week with the full squad. That's an expensive meeting. Best meetings we had. You make real progress. You have real debate. You disagree and you commit as a group and you move forward. You have to decentralize the approval cycles. I can't be involved because I can't scale. You have to be able to move faster than any one approver can go. You have to productize experimental design. So this is super important. Every company in here needs to understand what does it mean to run a test. And then make sure that all your squads understand what it means to be stat sig, how we're going to leverage it, how quickly we're going to run against it. Do we need to validate it? Does there need to be a second test? Is it MSA specific? What control group exposure are we going to use? And then once you have the experimental design, every team can run more tests autonomous, which is what you're really after. And then you're gated by OKR achievement. Until you hit the metric, you don't move on. Because it's the most important metric. It's not quarterly. It's not half a year. It's the most important metric. It's your lifeblood. So hit it and then move on. The third one, which is something ClassPass learned, um, and many companies learn, and it's the hardest, is that nothing is precious. The fastest growing companies in the world know that nothing is precious. Not a person, not a product, not a feature, not an audience, not a community, not a city. They're ruthless in how they prioritize because they do what's best for the business at every turn. Often the hardest and most complicated business decision is the one you have to make, and you have to make it right now. And I guarantee you, many of you in the audience had something just pop into your head, and you're like, oh, it's like she's talking to me. Yes, that decision, go back to your team, make it. Stop putting it off. Stop kicking the can down the road, which is what we do. Oh, that's just so complicated. I can't get to it. It would be too painful. It'd be a horrible press day. I can't go there. That's where your growth is sitting. It's taxing your brain. It's taxing your time. It's taxing your resources. ClassPass had this, a little story here, I guess. Still very emotional to talk about, but we had this amazing product. It's the product we were famous for. Many of you might know it because we're actually in Seattle. $99 unlimited product. So you could go to any studio fitness in your area as many times as you wanted in a month for $99. Beautiful, NPS of north of 70, growth out, you know, double digits month over month, scaling to all these cities, tons of press support, tons of beautiful links and ambassadorship, and just good, awesome consumer love. One small little problem. That was an unprofitable plan for us. It was sinking our business. And even more so, to try to get around that, we had to go to our amazing product team, these epically bright minds, and say, can you build features that stop people from working out? Can you go against the very mission in which our founder started this company? And it killed everyone every day to try to scope out product features that hurt our customers. And so we tried for a year to figure out how to make this work, and it was a taxing decision. We launched new plans, we launched new features, and we just needed to sunset the product. We needed to kill the product. We needed to trust that we had value outside one product and that we could build other plans the world wanted. And that's what we started to work on, and that worked. It was a hard day that led for a couple hard weeks. I put up some of my favorite tweets. We have a very creative community, beautiful gifts, very humorous. It was a really hard day. Honestly, the hardest day of my whole career, mainly because I had to watch 200 awesome class passers experience what it feels like to let down the people they wake up to 
to serve. And I would do almost anything to never experience that again, except for that I would do it again, because it's what the business needed. And you have to make that hard decision. There was no way around it. You just got to sign up for that tour of duty and get it done. You have to manage the dynamics, manage the people, manage the customers, manage the press, the partners, the board. It's hard. A lot of other companies have done this, right? Pinterest was tote. The founder wanted to build tote. The problem was mobile payments weren't ready. That wasn't a real thing back then. He had to shift his point of view. He had to serve the world in a different way. Twitter's been a million things. They've made a million executive decisions, hires and fires, bringing people back in. They're making the right decision, the hard decision, the best they know with the information they have at the time. And we can't judge them for that. Because there's a lot of other companies that don't stand up and make the decision. And if you want to be a fast-growing company, you have to trust that you will figure it out and make the hard decision. How do we do that for real? You have to get ruthless on product prioritization. If there's a feature in your feature suite that is built just because you wanted to build it, but customers don't love it, stop investing in it. Sunset it. Or if some people love it and those people are special, let them know it's going away and that you'll, you'll find a way to make them happy. Revisit prices often. Most companies only revisit prices one to two times a year. You should be doing it at least every quarter. If you have established pricing power in your industry, raise your prices. If you have that much value for the world, let the revenue be the proxy for the value you've built. Take that money, reinvest it back into the product, and serve them even better. Don't be afraid. You built something valuable. You can't lose yourself in partnerships. I've done this at multiple companies where, especially when you're early or you're a consultancy and you're serving clients, you trade on the logos. You get that one great logo, that Fortune 500, Fortune 1000, and it buries your company because it takes all your services, all your creative, all your time. All of your management has to spend your time with that one partner because they expect them to be in the room. Fire that partner. Fire that Fortune 500. Trade on other logos. Trust that you'll figure it out. This next one's probably the hardest. It's fire the wrong people. Hire the right ones. Time and time again, we get caught up in this one or two people are the people, or the five people, or the 10 people. And when I talk to someone, you hear this because they say they go into a room and that's a great idea. We should do that, but so-and-so won't like it. So-and-so will never get on board. So-and-so will hate that idea. Do yourself a favor and fire so-and-so. Thank you. That, didn't expect a clap, but I like, appreciate that. It's so hard, but it's better for them. It's better for you. And you have to trust that your company is better than any one or two or five or ten people. And you have to do that. Great leaders make the decision. You have to structure around the outcome and not the people. That's the other thing I often have done in my past. I've loved a certain person. They're really good at their job, and I structure my team around them. No. I have to structure around the business. My rule is I need to do what's right for the business while trying to do what's right for my people. And that's the hierarchy I've signed up for as a leader. It's the hierarchy that is expected of me to drive growth. The fourth one, you have to play to your advantages obsessively. This one is, again, something I didn't do early that now I'm like all about. And you see this time and time again. Fast growing companies point to this as what they did early. They do not build for building's sake. You come in as a growth leader, you're like, ah, oh, I could stand up all these channels, I'm gonna have a really diversified acquisition portfolio, it's gonna be beautiful, we're gonna have redundancy in case anything happens or there's a penalty, it's gonna be great. You start hiring people and specialists and standing it all up and it's beautiful. That's not how companies grow inflection opportunity growth. Instead, they go deep on what's proprietary to their company. What do you have the opportunity to win at that your competitor could never touch? Go deep on that, exploit it get such a handhold on it that no one else could get there, then you move on and you stand up the beautiful acquisition portfolio. So when I got hired at ClassPass, here are the things I did not do in my first year as CMO. Pretty much marketing. <laughs> I just didn't do the marketing. Um, and in fact, I killed a lot of things that were in flight. For a consumer company that has a ton of excitement and brand equity, I shut down the influencer strategy, the ambassador program. I killed corporate programs and partnerships, which you get a ton of, ton of inbound interest on. Killed events, shut down conversations on out of home, redistributed my brand investment. I basically shut it all down because I wanted to invest in what I knew no one else had, word of mouth. People that work out love to tell the world they worked out. Humble brag, I do it every day. If I get out of bed at 7 a.m., I'm telling you I got out of bed at 7 a.m. 
Um, I also bring people I know love to work out, and we work out together because it's a, it's a communal thing. It's an exciting, you know, endorphin-driven thing. That, that's what our business has. You have your own thing. And I went deep. I built a refer friend V2, V3. I launched an invite a friend program. We launched Sprinkles, which is like social trust throughout the product. Uh, we launched a social layer connection so I could see where people were working out, what studios they were favoriting. Uh, book with friends feature so we could book together. I rewrote the reservation system with my product team as a marketer. I gave my engineers to those features because I knew that it would play into my acquisition flywheel. That's what you have to do. You have to go deep in the thing your company has to build yourself the runway and the margin to go broad. The best companies in the world have done it. Dropbox with referrals, Etsy with partners, LinkedIn with CRO, Wayfair with SEO, uh, Pinterest with affiliates. You think about that first two or three years that they got an unexpected advantage in market, they went deep in a channel that worked for them, and they got a stronghold on the market, and then they went back and stood up marketing, which is hard. So how do we do that for real? This is probably the hardest part. For one, like most importantly, stop building just because people tell you you should build, or because we tell ourselves we should build because we're builders. It's really hard to see a channel that's not beautiful and just be like, I'm sorry, you're not beautiful. Good luck, you know? And it's really hard to sit in a room with the board member where they tell you that their other acquisition portfolio companies crushed it in ABC, and why aren't you doing ABC? And you stand there and you're like, because I'm not, you know? That's the standing up. That's kind of, you know, it's, it's the conversation, what Tara's talking about, being the CEO, having the, the spine to stand up and say, I know what I'm doing, and I'm doing it, and it's going to work. You need to know your proprietary advantage. You know, ClassPass has this beautiful set of reviews. We're going to go deep in what that can do for our business because no one else has these reviews. You need to educate your teams on these levers so that they can see, again, the open green field, the magic opportunities. You need to organize around these proprietary advantages. We're going to have an entire set of squads and teams around reviews in UGC, because that's an advantage to us. And we've already done this. In fact, I was talking with Matt, and he's going to stand up his own focus around understanding K-factor and virality, because that's one of our advantages. I need to know everything there is to know about that metric at our company so that we can think at a level that no one else can compete with. So those are just some of the ideas. The fifth and last one, the, the kind of pattern that you see, and this concept, we actually heard a little bit about it today, which is evergreen testing to make your case. This is just a straight up tactic to take back. And here's the problem. We as marketers align to the product team. And so we actually do our roadmaps when they do theirs. And that could be on a three month or a six month or a one month rolling basis. So then you get just done with a quarter, you start another quarter and you're starting to do your roadmap. And all of a sudden they're like, so what should we build? And you're like, we need to build this. That's where the growth is. And they're like, what's your proof? And I was like, I just know it. And they, that's not enough. How, how long will it take? Is it small, medium, or large? And you're like, I don't know. I haven't scoped it. And they're like, okay, I can't plan for this, so let's just revisit it next quarter. Three months gone, your competitor just built it. You just lost. You need to be ahead of every planning process at your company as a marketer, which means you have to allocate a percent of your time every quarter throughout the quarter for evergreen testing and business case making. Then you come into the product planning process and you're like, data, look at what it could do for us. Here's the business case. Here, I scoped it with you for a brief. I've done some light wireframes. Let's go build it. And they're like, let's do it. Here's a great example. This was the example of the Q2 roadmap against growth at ClassPass in 2016. And it's nine things. They were nine very awesome, important things, but they were nine things. This was the Q2 roadmap for 2017. Everything in yellow was growth. And it's because we spent a year figuring out how to pre-plan and make business cases. This is done through manual tests, bringing in temps, customer surveys. And what you see is I have some of the acquisition squad on growth, the engagement squads on growth, the plan and pricing squads on growth, the systems teams on growth. I stole some engineers from the studios team, and they're on the B2B side. Like, you just make the case for it, and the company will mobilize around the most important case but we have to do this for them. It's, it's what we owe them as a partner. So how do we do this? Organizing thesis-based uh, brainstorms cross-team is super important because what you don't want to do is bring a great idea that has had no one at the company involved but marketing. So something like, I think we should open up the app because right now it's locked. You know, what does it mean to open up the app? Let's bring in anyone that wants to talk about that and think about all the great apps we love and the different ways that they're open platform. Model home, tour, freemium. Let's talk about all the models and all the things we love. 
coming out of that brainstorm, you've already got buy-in, you've got interest, you've got passion, you're already way ahead of the game. We also need to be allocating about 20% of our ongoing central resources to testing. So central resources, copy, creative, could be analytics. About 20% of my creative stack is constantly testing against next quarter's roadmap. So that might be something on onboarding, it might be email, it might be abandoned cart campaigns, whatever it is. So I can go to product and say, I need to productize this. I've been running it with manual temps. We're seeing a point and lift or two point reduction to headline churn. This could be huge. You need to build the pre-prioritization roadmaps. You need to scope the product ask for them. Ian talked about this yesterday in content. We are a partner to these teams. We owe them what's in our brains. They're not, they're not asked to solve it for us. We owe them every idea and every great benchmark out there that we can find. We package it up and we're like, let's have a conversation about this. That's us being a good partner to them. You need to map to more than one OKR, multiple ones is best, to make the really strong business case. That's growth, three levers. Trifecta if you can affect all three. Those are the features your company should be building. And then this kind of evangelism, right? Everyone on my marketing leadership team is expected to spend a good amount of their bandwidth working with peers, educating them on what we're excited about, the areas we're nervous about, the gaps that we're behind, what our competitors are doing, and why we think we could win if we just did X. That's them with drinks and coffees and lunches and walk-bys. It's all the things that you need to do and you can't ignore it because this is a team, you know? So wrapping this party up, it isn't about the tactics. We know this. It's not about the platforms. We know what growth isn't. We know it in our hearts. But what it is is hard. It's investing in growth as a machine. It's hiring these creative, resourceful, low ego people that want to solve a problem and run super fast. Relentless execution, obsessive reinvestigation of what they're prioritizing, not precious about it, obsessed with having impact. And it touches everything. But when you do it, you crush it because your competitors don't want to put in this time. They don't want to manage emotions around the team and partner with someone and rethink about everything they've done and how they know how to do their job. They don't want to sunset their best product and have that conversation. So stand up and do it. You'll win. And the best part is you'll win. You'll get more from your customers to reinvest, and then you'll win and do even better by them which is like magic, right? It's like everything we wake up to do. So hopefully this was helpful. I did put up my information. If anyone wants to talk about it, please reach out. Thank you.